the right chair? Oh, yeah. <laughs> New Life Sanctuary. Wonderful. All right, so um, we're going to be in 2 Samuel and the 8th chapter. Find that Old Testament book, 2 Samuel chapter 8. And as you're finding 2 Samuel 8, I'll just remind you of what we looked at last week. Last week, we were, we were considering King David, God's man, God's chosen king to sit on the throne and to lead and guide, shepherd and provide for his covenant people, Israel. And we saw that David became deeply convicted early on in his reign. He saw that he, he was enjoying affluence and security, wealth, luxury. He was living in a house of cedar, and his eyes uh, fell upon the Ark of the Covenant, the most sacred piece of furniture in the tabernacle program. And he said, you know, here I am living in the house of cedar, and there's God's Ark, that sacred piece of furniture just living in a tent. And he said, I want to build something magnificent for the Lord's honor and glory. I want to build a house for the Ark of the Covenant and by extension, a place that will house all the sacred uh, items, furniture items in the tabernacle program, the table of showbread and the altar of incense and all that. And he told his concerns to Nathan the prophet and the prophet gave David a reply straight from God and said, David, everything you have, I gave you. <laughs> That house of cedar, I gave it to you. All the authority, privileges, responsibility, all the uh, luxuries, I gave them to you, David. And David, you think to build me a house? I will build you a house. David, you're going to build a nice temple. That's, that's fine, but I will build for you an everlasting royal dynasty. And one of the things we learned there in that message is that you and I can never think that we're going to outgive God. He gave us our being. He gave us our identity. He gave us truth, hope, privileges, recognition, responsibilities, a place reserved in heaven for us in the household of faith. And God is very pleased when we make sacrifice for him. Yes, he's very pleased, but we'll never give him anything close to what he's already given us and what he plans to give us in the future. It's a beautiful message there, I think. Well, as we move now to chapter 8, we're just sort of going to sort of uh, synopsize chapter 8. But chapter 8 uh, gives us a record of David's stupendous victories under God. Uh, he will subdue the Philistines. Uh, he will put these uh, enemies of God's people under his feet. And um, he's doing it all under God. This is by God's uh, ordination, by God's enabling power. God has granted wisdom and courage to Israel to get this done. And, of course, he's poured out an extra measure of these things on Israel's king, David. But look at 2 Samuel 8 and verse uh, 15. This is a summary statement here for us regarding chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 15. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered judgment and justice to all the people, now, or to all his people. That there reminds me of Jesus. Maybe it reminds you of Jesus Christ as well. You remember Isaiah, the Christmas prophet? In Isaiah, the ninth chapter, uh, we are told that uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And, and we get all kinds of neat descriptions there of who? Jesus. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And we're told that under this coming king, which we recognize to be Jesus, uh, that king is going to order and establish his kingdom with what? Judgment and justice forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts, he has performed this. To the extent that David does what is right in the eyes of God, he is a beautiful shadow and type, a prefigurement of Jesus coming. So right there, just in, this, in the language that he administered judgment and justice to all his people, all of a sudden, we, we notice that language there maps on to something we read in Isaiah. And it, all these beautiful things point us to Jesus Christ, the lover of our souls, the one who loved us first, the one who redeemed this created order back to himself by his precious blood, the one who will return one day. Don't lose heart. Don't get depressed. Don't pack it in. Things are going to change. King Jesus will return, and he will make all things right. And uh, that has to be before our eyes or you're just going to lose hope. Don't lose hope. 
it's going to be okay. Well, let's go now to uh, chapter 9, and we're going to see some very nice and encouraging things here. Chapter 9 and verse 1. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, uh, this is a major, major theme in the Bible. You're going to track this all the way through the Scriptures. Kindness and blessing shown to somebody because of somebody else. Now here, uh, David expressed his desire to show blessing and kindness to somebody in the household of Saul, that wicked king, for whose sake? Not for Saul's sake, but for Jonathan, Saul's son's sake. See? Now that is a major theme in the Bible. We're going to show blessing and kindness to this guy, not that he deserves it, but for the sake of somebody else. You can track that all the way through the Bible. Lot, who was pretty worldly-minded, was shown blessing and kindness of the Lord for Abraham's sake. So was Jacob, who started out as a deceiver, a supplanter. Remember Jacob? Had his name changed to, um, to Israel. Uh, Jacob was shown kindness because of Abraham's sake. Laban the Syrian was as wicked as you can imagine. He was blessed and shown kindness for Jacob's sake. You see a theme going on here. Uh, Potiphar the Egyptian was shown blessing and kindness for Joseph's sake. And uh, you remember Rahab? Who remembers Rahab the harlot there in Jericho? Her whole family was shown blessing and kindness and preservation through judgment for her sake. And finally, if you come to Isaiah 37 and you go to 1 Kings, or rather 2 Kings chapter 20, Jerusalem, the city of God, is shown blessing and protection for David's sake. And you notice this theme, it just, it goes all the way through the entire Bible. Now, why would God want to emphasize this historically and in his sacred library, the Bible? Why would he want to emphasize blessing and kindness shown to one person for the sake of another person? I think because it points to that spectacular and great truth articulated in 1 John 2.12, that our sins are forgiven for his great namesake. And I, in fact, I love the old King James. The old King James in Ephesians 4.32 says that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. God has shown us tremendous blessing and kindness for Christ's sake. Because God has come into this created order in the person of his beloved son, Jesus. And for the sake of Jesus, that obedient one, and all that he's accomplished, God will show us blessing and kindness. Isn't that amazing? Now, that is an amazing transference there. Wonderful. Now, the context there, I'm just gonna, we're going to return to this too. The context in Ephesians 4 is that because God showed such blessing and kindness to us for Christ's sake, he forgave us for Christ's sake, we ought to now feel some moral obligation to extend the same kindness and tenderheartedness and forgiveness to others who are in the household of faith. We are, let's just face it, super saturated with imperfection. Spiritually, we're born again, we're new creatures, but the flesh is still here, and we jump to conclusions, we make wrong judgments, we get short, we get irritable, we don't always treat each other the way we should, God knows that. That's why Paul is so clear on this. Listen, bear with each other. Extend the same kindness to each other that God extended to you. You should feel the force of that. We have some moral obligation. And I've said this before to people, and I'll say it again, and I mean it. None of us here, individually or collectively, have ever offended one another the way we've offended God. And yet God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us we ought to extend the same grace and forgiveness, understanding to each other here in the household of faith. Jesus said it in John 13. Didn't he say it? He said, by this, the world will know that you are my disciples. You have love for each other. And it's not just lip service. It's real tender-hearted love toward each other. For some people, we're the only Bible they've ever seen. So let's extend the same kindness to each other that God extended towards us for Christ's sake. Now, let's read... The next uh, two verses here, verses 2 and 3 together. And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? 
And he said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Now, I just want to pause here for a second here and notice the, the wisdom in what David said. Uh, David said uh, in verse 1, uh, he wanted to show kindness to somebody in the household of Saul. And in verse 3, he said he wanted to show the kindness of God. I want you to catch that and feel the force of that one. Whatever kindness we may show others, it's commendable in the eyes of God, yes. God doesn't ignore these things. They are good. They reflect his nature and character. But those attributes that God finds good, those actions that he finds commendable in us, through us, we got to understand those are just derivative. We get that? Goodness, kindness, patience, love, mercy, generosity, justice, those, those things are original with God. They're a part of his character, and they have been a part of his character from eternity into eternity. And to the extent that we display such things, we're just displaying what's derivative, what God has granted us to share with others. And David understands that. He wants to show the kindness of God. In fact, David will say in Psalm 16 in verse 2, speaking to God, my goodness is nothing apart from you, says David. God, he understands, is in his nature and character the standard of what is right and good and noble, just and true. So when we think that we're doing something good on this earth, that's fine, but we give credit to God who has granted these things to us to share with others. You get the picture. We just have nothing in ourselves, nothing original with us but our sin. And we want to give God the credit for what he has done and who he is. Well, let's look at what happened here, verse 4. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amuel, Amuel in Lodabar. Then the king sent and brought him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his fa face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant, that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul, to all his house. You, therefore, and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest, and that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. You get the picture here. Uh, Jonathan had a son named Mephibosheth who was a cripple, and no doubt he was looked down upon, first of all, because of his infirmity, and second of all, because of his, uh, well, because of his lineage, his heritage. People knew that Saul was no good. And now there he is in a place called Lodabar, which means no pasture there. His life didn't look so good for a while. But David decided he was going to show grace, mercy, and kindness to Mephibosheth. I think uh, it's very interesting, right at the bat, the, right off the bat, when, when the two men meet, David said to Mephibosheth, do not fear. First thing he said to him, don't be afraid of me. Now, Mephibosheth might have been afraid of David. Sure, uh, he might have shown that man hostility for Saul's sake, because Saul was as wicked as anything. 
But David chose to show kindness and mercy and generosity for Jonathan's sake. And I want us to think now about the Lord Jesus and to think about God, his Father. God might have shown hostility to all of us for Adam's sake, original man Adam, because Adam was our representative. He was our federal head, and we were in Adam at the beginning. Spiritually, embryonically, somehow, some way, we were there in Adam when he transgressed knowingly, willingly against God. And we all bore that guilt too. We came into the world children of wrath, but instead God chose to show us kindness for Christ's sake. See that? The choice he made there. Like David. David could have shown hostility for Saul's sake. He said, forget it, I'll show you kindness for, for Jonathan's sake. And God shows us kindness for Christ's sake. And uh, David here, we read that he was going to restore everything that belonged to Saul. In verse 9, the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given your master's son all that belonged to Saul in all his house. He restored to Mephibosheth everything that belonged to Saul. And again, that reminds me of Jesus. You know, Adam was, was king of this world. You remember that, the dawn of human history? God, God created the, you know, the heaven and the heaven of heavens and all their host. But he tells us that the earth he has given to the children of the sons of men. That the, the created order under heaven was entrusted to original man Adam. He was the king of the creation. And he forfeited all of it. He just basically handed it over to Satan. He gave it away. He lost it. But Jesus came into the world, and by his precious blood, he has reconciled all things to himself. And I think this is hinted at in Psalm 69 and verse 4, where the text says, I restored that which I took not away. Adam is guilty, lost it all for us. But Jesus Christ, the God-man, the, the last Adam, came into the world, and by the blood of his cross, he has restored that which he, which he didn't lose, which he didn't give away. And that's amazing. And that, of course, is the theme of the entire Bible, isn't it? The greatness of God in Christ, who he is, what he's accomplished, what he yet will accomplish. And I, I just love the instruction I got years ago from a gifted Bible teacher. He said, you open up the Bible... And if you're not looking for Jesus Christ, close it. Just close it again. He is on every page. Everything speaks to us of the goodness of God in Christ. Well, this is pure uh, grace being shown to Mephibosheth here. Mephibosheth, of course, is the crippled man and uh, really couldn't do much for David. And he is from a place called Lodabar, which means not a pasture. And um, David, by sheer grace took that person from a pastureless wilderness and he brought him to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is called the holy city in the Bible. It's called the city of the great king. It's called the city of peace. And he said, you're going to come to Jerusalem and you're going to sit at the king's table. Now I want you to think very carefully about what we're reading here. David is a good shepherd from Bethlehem, now seated on a throne in Jerusalem and took this poor cripple from a pastureless wasteland and brought him to the city of the great king and said, you're going to eat at my table now. You're going to be like one of my sons here. Now, who does that remind you of? <laughs> the Lord Jesus. In John chapter 10, Jesus identified himself as the good shepherd who lays his life down for the sheep. He did, is it not the case? Did he not take us all from a pastureless wilderness? All of us who were without strength, that was our opening verse, Romans 5. We were all like helpless cripples. We could do nothing to help our condition. We were all estranged from God. We were all under the just condemnation of God, and we didn't have any strength or, or moral integrity, not one ounce, to move us one inch in the direction of solving that horrible problem we had. And yet God in Christ called us to believe in Him, to receive Him as our Lord and our Savior, and he regenerated us, and he made us something new, and he adopted us as sons. It's amazing. David, in the text here, was very clear. I am going to provide for all of Mephibosheth's needs. Whatever he needs, it's, he's got it. I'm going to take care of his needs. So says the great king of Jerusalem, God's appointed king. Well, 
not, there's no difference between uh, us and Mephibosheth. We came to Christ very needy, and Christ has promised us to take care of all our needs. And actually, he articulates that through his man, Paul. The great apostle Paul says in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 19, My God shall supply all your what? All your need, according to his riches and glory. He, and now, he didn't say, let's, let's have a little side note here. I will provide for all your wants. That's not there. There may be some Bible version that says that. Mine doesn't. <laughs> Because your felt wants and mine too may be things that are not good for us. And so God sometimes says no, doesn't he? You say, oh, I just want this thing so bad, Lord. You just must grant this to me. God says, no, that's not something you need right now. And in fact, if I do grant it to you, it's going to blow up in your face and it'll be a disaster. You know, and I'll give you a real mundane, low-level example in my home. I used to ride a motorcycle for years. I had, my own, I had a couple different bikes. Now I've got this little pipsqueak bike, antique bike, 40 years old. I'm trying desperately to get it to run. And if it isn't one thing, it's another. And then all of a sudden I think in my mind, well, just a minute here. If I get this thing running, maybe I'll get myself killed yet. Maybe there's a reason why this thing isn't running. You know, you ever think of that? The Bible says that God works all things together for, good, for the good of those that love him to those who are called according to his purpose. I just gave a little low-level mundane example there, but God will supply our need. And we have to believe him on that. Okay? I believe him. And David is a little foreshadow of that, isn't he? A, a little prefigurement. He takes this helpless man and for Jonathan's sake blesses him, brings him into his home and says, I'm going to take care of all your need. You are no longer a needy person. Notice this too. He said, you're going to sit at my table. You're going to eat together with me and with my sons. You will be just like one of my sons. Now, the Bible says in the, John, the first chapter, as many as received Jesus, to them gave he the right to be called the, the sons of God. You, you are adopted. This is Romans 8, 15. God has not given us the spirit of uh, fear. You don't have the spirit of, of bondage to fear anymore but the spirit of adoption through whom we cry out, Abba, Father. We've, by faith, you came to Jesus and uh, he blessed us so tremendously and he actually adopted us into the family of God. And we're reading now in the book of Hebrews, in the first chapter, that Christ, the Son of God, is actually not ashamed to call us brethren. Now that's amazing to me. Because I can only try to imagine if I were perfect looking at me, I might be ashamed to call John Feeks my brother. I might be ashamed if I knew everything there was to know about that guy. But Christ is not ashamed to call me his brother. Isn't that something? He's not ashamed to call you brothers and sisters either. We are heirs of God in the family of God and we are joint heirs with Christ. And we have a very important stupendous place in the plans and purposes of God. Otherwise, he wouldn't have saved you and me. And it starts off with our adoption. We sit at his table, as it were, every time we take communion. We are coming to the Lord's table, a little prefigurement of this beautiful, spectacular, inaugural banquet when Jesus returns to the earth as King of kings and Lord of lords. And we sit down together with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. And we talked about what's on the menu. <laughs> We're going to sit at the king's table for real with him present. Beautiful. Uh, notice this, please. Mephibosheth, a cripple. If he, if he tried to stand in front of you, he might not be able to. Maybe with a walker or with some crutches or something. He might be able to do it. it would be very, his, his infirmity would be very obvious to all of us. But he is going to sit down at the king's table with all the other sons of the king, and those crippled feet are hidden under the table. So if you were sitting at the king's table there with Mephibosheth and the king's sons, you know what you'd see? Equality. Your infirmities are not there for, ev for everyone to gawk at. You are an equal, among equals, at the king's table. Visually, outwardly, there is equality. 
at the king's table. And your infirmity is not dredged out to be mocked at or to be ridiculed or for you to be looked down upon. And that's a beautiful truth there. I think we should think about that truth. This speaks to us of the equality that exists even here and now in the household of faith. And, and I think sometimes we get the idea that the pastor is somehow maybe a little bit more important than everybody else. Maybe he's a little more valuable than, than everybody else. We, I don't know that that's a big thing in North America. It can be. In other countries, it is. I've been entrusted by God to study and teach the Scriptures. I labor, I really do, in the Word and Doctrine. Because I love the Lord and I love the Word of whom it speaks. But we're all equal in value and dignity here. We're all equally important here. The same blood that purchased me purchased you. We can sit at the Lord's table together and there's complete equality here. And in fact, Paul wants to make a big deal about that in Galatians, the third chapter. When it comes to intrinsic worth, value, dignity, importance, Paul will say there's neither male nor female, there's neither Greek nor Jew nor bond or free. The same blood bought me, bought you. And we're all in this together. And we all have important things to do as a new covenant priesthood, as members of the household of faith, as part of this thing Paul calls, calls the pillar in the ground of the truth. Together we're custodians of the life-saving gospel of Jesus Christ. And it may shock you and it may surprise you to stop and think for a moment that in all the world, only the household of faith, only new covenant Christian believers are entrusted with the gospel to share it. In all the world, we are the custodians of the gospel. You say, Lord, why didn't you entrust that to angels? They could do a much better job than we can. God says, no, I've chosen to work with imperfection. I've chosen to entrust this life-saving gospel to those who are the recipients of its saving benefits. And so God has chosen in the present dispensation to work with imperfection. And so he does. <laughs> and the glory will go to him because we're just vessels of clay, fragile, in need of fixing, restoring, protection, always in need, but God says, that's the vessels I've chosen to communicate the life-saving life gospel truth. The point is, there's equality here, and it must be recognized, all, always, every, every time. In fact, James goes on a, a little bit of a tirade in his epistle, doesn't he? James chapter 2, he says, if you show partiality amongst each other, you've become judges with evil thoughts. And he goes into a whole thing about that. If, someone, if a rich brother comes here with a beautiful ring and costly array, you don't give him a place of prominence. And um, if a poor brother or sister comes in, you put them in a low place. We don't operate like that around here. And I don't see a big problem here in our church. Let's not have a problem here with that kind of thing. Did, I wonder if I shared this before. You know, in Winnipeg, maybe I shared this. If I did, don't let your eyes glaze over. In Winnipeg, they did this little thing called pulpit swap. Did I ever mention that? Pulpit swapping. I thought it was a great idea. Where churches, all, ch churches who wanted to be a part of this, they would um, exchange pastors one Sunday. So all kinds of churches, hundreds and hundreds of churches in Winnipeg switched up. And you got to, ch you got to choose, hey, I think I'd like to preach at that church this time around. And if they could accommodate you, they would. But, and doesn't that sound, now that sounds good to me. That's a way to knit us all together. We're all in this together. We're all part of the same kingdom. But guess what? I heard from a pastor of a very small church that he was forbidden from preaching at the big churches. You know the big churches in Winnipeg with thousands of people? You can't, no, no, you can't preach there. Only the pastors of the big churches, and we have a few of them, only they can they swap pulpits. And you little guys can swap pulpits. Oh, what is that? As though the pastor of the little church isn't studying the Bible, isn't talking to God about these things, he doesn't have a message from God for his saints. I don't like that attitude at all. And I don't want to see it here in this church. So let's not have it here. Okay? I don't see a big problem. I like where we're going, personally. Let's start well and let's finish well. Jesus said in John 15, 
we're his friends. You know, sometimes, yeah, sometimes you kind of have to put it this way. i be very careful. <laughs> the people who drive you the most crazy in this world are the people in your family sometimes. You drive me the most nuts. I mean, I love you, but you drive me the most crazy. Maybe it's because I love you. Isn't that true? The ones who drive you the most nuts are your family. And you can't choose your family, but you can choose your friends. And Jesus said to the household of faith, you're my friends. Isn't that amazing? We're friends with the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King who inhabits eternity, the very image of God himself said, you're my friends, and I'll tell you what I'm doing. I will speak to my prophets and they'll let you know because I won't do anything in secret and hide it from you. You're my friends and you're my brothers, and I'm not ashamed to call you my brothers. You want to say, Lord, how can you talk like that? I feel like an utter failure from time to time with a sin debt and a whole history of regrets. And Jesus says, in effect, don't you think his blood is sufficient to cleanse that and restore you moment by moment and to keep you safe and secure in the household of faith and in the kingdom of God? Yes, his blood is sufficient. God, for Christ's sake, mysteriously has exalted us and called us brothers and friends. Jesus calls us those things. I say as I end my message here, let us feel some pressure here, some obligation to regard one another as exalted also. We're all in this together. And let's return to Romans, the fifth chapter in the sixth verse. While we were still without strength, Jesus came and died for the ungodly. We all, none of us deserved it. We didn't deserve a thing. But God in Christ came into the world in the fullness of time, and he bore that cross up Golgotha, and he endured the scourging and the mocking and the shame, and he hung there for six hours, and he bare our sin dead in full in his body on that tree. For love's sake, he did it. He was humiliated that we might be exalted. That there would be equality in the household of faith. And he called you and I to believe in all this, to receive the saving benefits of what he did there. And it's all prefigured in a dusty old book called 2 Samuel, in the person of King David and the cripple from Lodabar, Mephibosheth. I thought it was nice to think about those things this morning. I thought that would be very encouraging for us, okay? And that's the end of my message, and it's a little bit early, but that's okay. Can I seal this in our hearts and minds through prayer? Let's pray together. Almighty God, in Jesus' precious, beautiful name, uh, Lord, as pastor here, I want to ask you, God, please, please, please spare us, God, from our church services from ever collapsing into some kind of cold, sterile ritualism where we say the same words, but they are shallow in meaning now. Lord, may we never stop marveling at God in Christ and what he has done. May we never stop marveling at the awfulness of sin displayed there at the cross and yet the wonder of what Jesus did for us his glorious resurrection from the dead to justify us. Thank you, God, for his intercessory ministry, even now in the third heaven, our advocate, praying for us, a perfect advocate, a perfect lawyer, setting forth a perfect case for God's people. Thank you, God, for adopting us into the household of faith. Thank you, Good Shepherd, for taking us from a pastorless wasteland and calling us to your table. Thank you, Good Shepherd, that you've cleansed us and restored us, that you've restored that which you took not away. Thank you for being the last Adam, for fixing all the damage that the first Adam caused and restoring infinitely more. Lord, we thank you for your precious book, the Bible, that speaks to us of these mysterious and beautiful things, powerful things, May we never recover from them, and we, may we never regard them as old or outworn. May we continue, continually marvel at Jesus, the God-man, the image of the invisible God. May he truly 
truly hold the place of preeminence in our hearts and minds from this moment even into forever and ever. And it's in his beautiful name we pray it. Amen and amen. Praise our great God and coming King. And God bless you all.